Hello, my name is Sam Ord. I'm an ICU doctor at Nepean Hospital in Sydney. And this is a collection of lectures on ultrasound physics. And it's particularly aimed for candidates who are undertaking a more advanced qualification in ultrasound. And in this section of lectures, we're going to be talking about ultrasound transducers and beamforming concepts. And this will uh, take place in sort of three sections. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the different types of transducer, how the transducers are, the general sort of different parts of the transducer and how they're made, and what the function is of these different uh, transducer parts. And how this is going to be important in terms of controlling bandwidth, which we touched on in the last lecture. So transducers convert uh, energy and they're transferring electrical energy into sound energy. And the uh, important thing is, is that ultrasounds are, uh, ultrasound crystals are bidirectional, which means that they can transfer electrical energy into sound energy, and then they convert sound energy back into electrical energy. And there are different types of transducer, and they've got different ultrasound crystals in them, which have uh, a natural frequency which the crystals are going to be able to operate at. And trying to make, uh, gi giving these uh, transducers their specific type of ultrasound crystal means that they operate at their maximum efficiency, if you like. And I guess this is a bit like a guitar with strings that are going to vibrate at different frequencies to make different sounds. We've got the same kind of thing with different frequencies with the different ultrasound probes uh, trying to operate at their maximal frequency, both in terms of their operating frequency as well as their bandwidth or the range of frequencies that they can operate at. So the different transducers that we mainly deal with will consider maybe the abdominal probes, which are typically operating at a frequency of 2 to 4 megahertz. Attenuation coefficient is maybe 1 to 2 decibels per centimeter, and the typical penetration is anywhere from 10 to 30 centimeters. The, the next up, the frequency ladder, if you like, is the phased array, or the cardiac probes. Um, and these are operating anywhere between so 2.5 to 7.5 megahertz. They've got an attenuation coefficient in terms of the decibels per centimeter of between 2 to 5. And the typical penetration is a little bit less, obviously, with the higher frequencies. And they're dealing somewhere between 15 to 20 centimeters. Next up the ladder is the vascular probes, which are the linear probes, which uh, have a frequency of around 10 megahertz. They have a higher attenuation coefficient in terms of being able to image at certain depths and their typical penetration is six centimeters. And finally, the invasive probes, like the Obsangini probes, which are operating at 15 megahertz. They've got an even higher attenuation coefficient, and the typical penetration is even less, of around about four centimeters. So these transducers, they've got crystals in them, which are the crystals which are the uh, source of transmitting and receiving energy. And they're basically ground down, these ultrasound crystals are ground down to a thickness that's equal to exactly sort of half the wavelength of the desired frequency. And that's how these, are, these frequencies are, are made. In terms of the typical transducer, there are three main sections that we've got to discuss. The first is the uh, piezoelectric crystal, which uh, has got a damping material behind it and a matching layer in front of it. We'll start off by discussing the damping material. So again, think of the guitar string that's plucked and makes a sound. It's going to continue to sound for a long time after it's plucked. But damping is like putting your hand across the string, where it stops the string vibrating and then stops it making a sound. So typically, this damping material is made from plastic, which has uh, metal particles inserted into it. And uh, it helps dampen down this uh, pulse duration. So, as we try and remember that resolution depends on pulse duration, and again, like that guitar string, these, these piezoelectric crystals, as they're known, if we excite them with a burst of uh, electricity, they're going to have a long response and a long duration of oscillation. This damping material is going to shorten that ultrasonic pulse length. And so what's that going to do to resolution? It's going to improve the resolution, because you're going to shorten the pulse length. 
The other benefit that it has is it's, uh, it's going to help prevent sound waves or energy being reflected back, uh, back from the face, and that's uh, going to help prevent interference that's going on. Um, the negative side to this is that, unfortunately, as well as reducing the, the length, it's also going to reduce the intensity to somewhat. So the amplitude is not going to be quite as great once you've dampened down the uh, pulse duration. So here we can see the example of a transducer element which has a long ultrasound pulse. If we add the damping material, we can see that that pulse is reduced. So the pulse length is reduced, so that improves resolution. But again, just recapping from the, from the previous lecture, so what, what happens if we, reduce the pulse, uh, if we reduce the pulse length? We increase the number of, uh, we increase the bandwidth. We increase the range of frequencies that are contained within that, uh, within that bandwidth. So we have to try and remember that there, again, there's going to be a playoff between resolution and bandwidth because transducers have a limited bandwidth that they can operate at and that means that there's a certain range that they'll be able to receive the frequencies at and we want to try and uh, contain as many frequencies as we possibly can. So there's going to be a trade-off between resolution and bandwidth limitation. Let's ask a question. So what about PDOF or the, the pencil probe? It's, uh, what about the damping material contained in them? Well. Obviously, it's a bit of a trick question because we should remember that these are continuous wave Doppler probes. So there's no pulses that are used in these probes, and therefore no damping material is, uh, or no significant damping material is required. Um, so the main, one of the main components of this ultrasound probe is these crystals, of, as we've discussed. So these are typically the, it's what's known as the piezoelectric crystal effect. Um, so typically, the, it was a lead uh, zirconate titanate the, uh, was the structure that they're made from. I think m more commonly, some of the newer transducers are using a sort of ceramic polymer construction. I think whether it's an older or a new type of probe, the most important thing to remember is that you can't autoclave these. You know, you can't uh, try and sterilize these at uh, 300 degrees, 400 degrees Celsius, because that will deform the crystal and will stop them having their piezoelectric uh, crystal properties. The most important thing is that we can both transmit and receive sound energy. So these are bi-directional en energy converters. We can use electrical energy to form sound energy through them. And then in return, the sound energy can be replaced back into electrical energy, which can be analyzed by the ultrasound machine. And that's how we form the ultrasound image. The piezoelectric crystal effect is essentially by subjecting them to an alternating voltage, uh, electrical voltage, that's going to cause that crystal shape to change rapidly. As that crystal shape changes rapidly, it means that we're going to be causing expansion and contraction of the crystal. And that's going to produce high frequency sound waves or ultrasound waves, which have both compressions and rare refractions moving in a longitudinal direction, or the uh, direction of the compression and rare refraction is parallel to the direction of travel. These crystals can then receive the reflected sound or the echoes, and then that sound energy is going to be converted into the electrical energy. The strength of these returning echoes will determine the voltage strength, and that's how we get varying uh, echo brightness or echogenicity. And as well as determining the actual voltage of the structure, we can also measure the time between the transmission and the reception of the echo, and uh, using our distance, uh, velocity equals distance uh, divided by time, uh, velocity, distance equals velocity times time, we can then use uh, an idea to try and get an idea of what the depth is by measuring the time that it takes, assuming that the ultrasound wave is traveling at a speed of 1,540 meters per second. In terms of the actual frequency that is produced by these piezoelectric crystals, it is related to the thickness of the crystal layer. Thickness is inversely proportional to this frequency, so that if we have a thicker, uh, if we have a thicker crystal, we are going to have a smaller frequency. So an example for that is that thickness is typically half the wavelength. 
so that if we have a one millimeter thick crystal resonating at two megahertz, that's the uh, that's one millimeter th thick crystal is going to operate at two megahertz. If we had a two millimeter thick crystal, we're going to have a greater wavelength, which means that we are going to have a lower frequency. Finally, let's talk about the matching layer. So. Crystal acoustic impedance is very different from soft tissue and therefore you've got, an, you've got this large sort of intensity reflection coefficient and a large amount of energy is going to be reflected back at this uh, soft tissue interface. We use uh, ultrasound gel uh, as, uh, to try and uh, get a, a balance between these two structures but as, as well as the ultrasound gel we also use what's known as a matching layer and this is the surface or the surface over the, the crystals. So we get what's known as impedance matching. So we try and get uh, a value between the ultrasound elements and the soft tissue. And this is the same as ultrasound gel, as I said. So you get this kind of gradual progression in acoustic impedance. And this means that we can try and reduce the amount of energy that is reflected back at these, uh, uh, at these uh, acoustic uh, interfaces. Typically, the matching layer is a quarter of a wavelength thick. And this means that we can maximize that transmitted beam magnitude. As a bonus, this matching layer is also going to dampen the ultrasound wave to a certain extent, which can help shorten the pulse duration. And that means that we're going to improve resolution with this. But as we know, that is also going to broaden the transducer bandwidth. So in summary, we've got lots of different types of ultrasound transducers which operate at different frequencies. These different frequencies are dependent on different ultrasound crystals that are contained in them. Ultrasound crystals have bidirectional energy translation properties so that they can change electrical energy into sound energy and back again. Behind these ultrasound crystals is a damping material. This damping material is used so that we can shorten the pulse duration which is going to improve resolution, but it will also increase the bandwidth. And so we have to remember that the crystals are going to have a limited bandwidth that they're going to be op able to operate at. So again, a bit of a, um, a compensation has to be made between resolution and bandwidth recognition. Finally, the matching layer that sits in front of the ultrasound crystals is used to try and help uh, make a uh, more smooth transition or try to minimize the uh, impedance mismatch that's present between the ultrasound crystals and the soft tissue and ultrasound gel obviously helps in this as well. So that's it. Thank you very much. I hope you found that useful. Thank you.